Okay, everyone. Thank you for joining today's very special Susie State of the Consumer webinar titled The TikTok Effect. Uh, for those of you who are new to Suzy State of Consumer webinar series, welcome. What took you so long? Uh, we are now nearly one year in to our State of the Consumer webinar series. The first one being at the very beginning of March 2020. Seems like that was eons ago, doesn't it? Um, and we've since covered so many different topics, um, had so many great guests. But actually today is the most popular webinar we've had yet. Maybe it's because of our prestigious guests, uh, which it probably is. Um, and maybe it's because of this uh, very compelling topic, which is about TikTok. TikTok is a social media phenomenon uh, that has impacted so many businesses and so many lives. And today, we really want to dive into it. And we hope that everybody gets a ton of value. Um, we have a little bit of a different format today. I'm going to be giving a very quick talk, um, bringing in... Um, uh, who I'll be announcing in a second, our special guest from TikTok. And then we're actually going to open up a panel discussion with even a broader group. So uh, we're switching up a little bit today. Hope everyone's doing great. And uh, hopefully everyone gets a lot of value out of this today. So uh, we're going to dive on, uh, dive in. So in terms of today's guests, uh, we have an amazing group of guests that are joining today's webinar. Uh, we have Jake Cohen, who is a cookbook author and influencer on TikTok. Uh, I know we have a lot of companies in the food and beverage and CPG industry um, that are tuning in today. And I'm sure you'll all be very interested to know how Jake has built an audience of over half a million people with really compelling content, um, you know, around cooking, around the food category. Uh, we have my dear friend, Toby Daniels, uh, recently named Chief Innovation Officer of Adweek and also the founder of Social Media Week. Toby will be joining us a little bit later, uh, speaking about kind of the broader implications of TikTok within the social media world. Um, and Last but certainly not least, we have my dear friend, uh, Sophia Hernandez, who, a uh, quick kind of side note, actually was right beside me when we created our very first Suzy social me uh, Suzy State of the Consumer webinar way back in March. Uh, Sophia being a former Suzy um, employee heading our customer success group and has since gone on to do great things at TikTok. And it's amazing for things to come full circle today. So great audience. Um, and I'm going to dive right into it. Uh, for those of you who don't know Suzy, we are a real time market research platform that is built to help companies of all sizes make better, faster, more data driven decisions. We work now with over 300 enterprise brands across a variety of different categories, really to enable, uh, you know, market research and consumer insights at the speed of culture. And we did use our Suzy platform, as we always do, to uncover insights that will be covered during today's uh, webinar presentation. Um, so the TikTok effect, we're going to jump into it. I'm going to ask Sophia uh, to join us right now. Sophia, uh, you can drop in from either. There you are. So great to see Hello. you, Sophia. I can't believe that uh, it, it dawned on me when I was sort of talking about the origins of the State of the Consumer webinar that you were actually sitting right beside me when we came up with this idea, when we were freaked out, when the pandemic was first hitting. And uh, obviously, both of our lives have changed dramatically um, in the past year. And here you are um, working at this incredible brand. How? Tell me about your experience so far uh, being at TikTok. And I guess, what's the thing that surprised you most uh, by working there? Um, well, yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Sophia Hernandez. I had business marketing here at TikTok in North America. Matt, thanks for having me. Um, congratulations on Susie's growth and success. I love seeing you guys soar like a rocket ship. Um, I guess, you know, there are a lot of misconceptions about TikTok, and I know we're going to get into that in this session and in the panel, but the thing that has surprised me the most is how much TikTok is not like social media and how much it really plays in social entertainment. People um, feel like they can be their authentic selves here. It's not about likes. It's not about shares. It's not about connecting with family. It's about connecting the world with each other. And um, it's really exciting to be a part of it. Yeah. I mean, it's been amazing just from the outside and really seeing TikTok through the eyes of my two kids who are 13 and 15 who uh, live on the platform when I'm not trying to pull them back into school. But obviously, uh, it's been incredible seeing just the, the true impact that TikTok has had on culture and society um, in the past year. So looking forward to diving in uh, a little bit deeper today. 
Um, so we're going to go towards, looks like Abel, our slides just vanished. So if you wouldn't mind pulling those back open, um, I could wing it and show everyone how good I am at winging it. There we go. But I'd rather not do that today. Uh, so let's just dive into it. So TikTok itself, and we're not going to go too deep into the metrics of TikTok today, but, um, a hundred million monthly active users, um, in 2020 alone on TikTok. So we are talking about scale, uh, that is not, uh, you know, reached by, basically any other social media platform besides obviously a few uh, select companies who we're talking about today, whether it be, um, you know, the Facebooks of the world or the YouTubes. Um, so really, you know, this is a company that now has taken main stage as a preeminent social platform or one that companies really can no longer, um, you know, overlook. So I'm going to take a step back for a second and just talk about the trends that we've seen in 2020 in social media and its implications for 2021, because I think it'd be a, a good way to really frame today's discussion. Obviously, Sophia, if you have any uh, points in building on that, yes, feel free to uh, chime in. Um, obviously, when we look back to 2020, we can't look, we'll never look at 2020 without thinking about the election is obviously a huge driver and all the political discourse um, and, and resulting social discourse that we saw um, here in America. And, and politics really did take main stage um, in social media and in on many platforms, uh, not the TikTok platform uh, to a certain to, to really any extent, but certainly many others like Twitter and Facebook. Politics really became the central theme, and I think for many people, really created sort of a distasteful experience. And a lot of people had to reframe their use of those platforms based upon the political environment uh, that we saw in 2020. Obviously, the pandemic had an incredible impact on social media. You had millions of people stuck at home without their love, many of their loved ones, without their friends, without any form of excitement. And it was really, for many people, social media that filled that void. Uh, for so long, we've talked about social media being connective tissue in terms of building community at scale. And now we were thrust into an environment where social media sort of became mandatory for many. And in doing so, brought so many people into the social media fold that perhaps weren't there before. I mean, we can take it from good old uh, Grandpa Joe 1933 um, to, to actually see how uh, social media has really taken hold of not just young consumers. And I talked about during my book, Youth Nation, how Facebook was invented in the college market and then went to teenagers and went to moms and start to grow. And here we are in 2021 and the fastest growing category on social media overall is the baby boomer. So um, my kids can say, OK, boomer all they want. But the reality is that uh, baby boomers have now become a force to be reckoned with in social media. So really, you know, it's every demographic that is looking at social media front and center in terms of how they communicate uh, with one another. Um, I personally got a, a ton of benefit from following artists and, and feeling connected to entertainers on social media during 2020. Uh, DJ D Nice, who was sort of a, I wouldn't call a little known DJ, but he certainly wasn't a superstar, um, leveraged live streaming of uh, on Instagram and other platforms of DJ sets really to connect people through music. And I think, you know, it was a year where certainly live, live streaming became mainstream um, for many different brands, for many different um, athletes and artists to really connect with their audience. And I think, you know, this really starts to show a roadmap moving forward of where socials headed and live was obviously a big part of it. We saw many uh, other platforms kind of take this sort of stories concept and integrate it into their tools. Uh, LinkedIn recently announced the stories concept where you can post short form, um, you know, stories uh, that were ephemeral in nature that disappeared after 24 hours. Twitter unrolled uh, out, um, rolled out their fleets feature. Uh, where say that 10 times in a row. Uh, Twitter rolled out their fleets feature, which allows consumers to do the same, post this ephemeral images, um, ephemeral media, um, in a different type of feed. So you're starting to see sort of some copycat feature functionality. I think obviously it was incredibly successful, uh, with companies like Snapchat early on. Instagram very famously rolled in the stories there. Uh, after. And I think you're going to continue to see stories as something that many creators focus on um, at way, as, as different ways to connect with their audience. Uh, we start to see new technologies take hold. Uh, all granted reality and, and the rollout of the new iPhone really made this even more palpable this year, uh, created a whole new form for creators and brands to interact with consumers. Uh, what you're looking at here is a Michael Kors activation of really, you know, an augmented reality application where you can try on the lenses within a social shopping experience. We saw companies uh, like Warby Parker also really innovate in the eyewear category. And I think augmented 
augmented reality and even virtual reality is going to continue to take uh, much more of a center stage in terms of the new features and functionalities that social platforms um, offer uh, to their consumers. So I think, you know, it gives consumers and creators really a, a new way to express themselves um, and to interact with other people. And as the technology gets better and better, the, the possibilities are truly limitless. Um, we start to see, speaking of social shopping, it really become more moving into the center in terms of how brands are looking at their e-commerce strategy. For so long, social media was sort of upper funnel. It was a way to build awareness. And then you'd be driving consumers to places like Amazon or Shopify driven pop properties where they can you know, transact. But now what we're starting to see as so many of these social platforms get more pressure from Wall Street to increase earnings, that they need to actually take their piece of the pie of the bottom of the funnel. And because of that, we're starting to see social shopping being very tightly integrated um, into some of the social media functionality. And it'll be interesting to see how brands um, like TikTok continue to innovate in the social shopping um, you know, arena moving forward. Just yesterday, it was announced that Shopify is going to now be powering um, e-commerce on a variety of different Facebook-based platforms. And Shopify stock shot up to an all-time high. So you know, the integration of content into commerce. Uh, that was actually uh, the name of a book by our Susie's president, Avi Savar, very long ago, content to commerce. It's all kind of starting to happen uh, right now. You know, the integration of people interacting with content and then very fluidly being dropped into a commerce uh, driven environment. More recently, we start to see really the power of individuals on social media platforms uh, like Reddit really move markets. Uh, all of you have probably heard at nauseam about what's been going on on platforms like Reddit where um, groups of uh, very um, enthusiastic investors, let's put it that way, have decided to punish um, you know, large hedge funds for shorting stocks like GameStop and have actually forced um, one huge hedge fund to lose billions and billions of dollars. So it just goes to show the power of social media. We're starting to see in Russia right now, uh, people really dissenting about what's going on right now and pushing back. Obviously, we saw this loud and clear during the U.S. election. You know, the people are gaining more and more power. They're leveraging new and unique ways to, to basically harness the power of social media to have outputs like we never would have imagined when Facebook was first um, kind of came onto the scene, um, you know, about, I guess, almost 20 years ago. Um, identity, I think, was less of an issue last year, but I think you're going to start to see it come into much more focus in 2021, meaning that in the world of bots and trolls and people who are posting who you don't know who they are, I think it's going to be incumbent on platforms moving forward to really put identity front and center, to identify individuals, to make sure they are who they say they are um, when they're posting on social media. And if I'm an advertiser, you know, I'm going to sort of start to demand this um, from the platforms that I support because I think it's very dangerous to have environments where people are, uh, you know, I guess, misleading as to their who their identity really is, I think create a lot of issues. And we've seen those issues certainly play out. Um, and then lastly, but certainly not least, you know, brands have, I think, understood now more than ever that they have no choice but to use social media to take a stand from a social standpoint. Um, they can no longer hide in the background. And whether um, it it's what happened this year with the Black Lives Matter movement, whether it's brands feeling like they have no choice or, or they have a social or corporate responsibility to support people impacted by the pandemic. One thing we saw in 2020 is way more brands than we've ever seen before step into the fold, not just be marketers, but be responsible corporate citizens um, in terms of supporting things that they stood by. And I think Frankly, it's the millennial employees and the Gen Z employees at these companies that are pressuring a lot of the corporate boards and corporate management teams to say, if I'm going to work at this company, I need to know that you're standing for things that I believe in. Otherwise, I'm going to go work at another company. And I think this was the year where certainly um, social movements and again, brands, social responsibilities really were put um, front and center. And then lastly, you know, at towards the end of this year and coming into 2021, we're starting to see um, some new applications of social media pop up. Uh, Clubhouse is a um, social platform. They're calling it a drop in audio platform that's absolutely exploding. And uh, the way I best describe it to people, it's basically like the radio meets Twitter, where people can instantly uh, create their own, um, you know, audio based programming, and you can easily connect with who you're connected to on social media. So it's going to re really be interesting uh, to see moving forward with the boom of platforms like podcasting. 
you know, and sort of the crossroads of something like a clubhouse, which really sits um, at the intersection of, of podcasting and social media, how is this going to evolve? Is this going to be a fad or is this going to be something that we're going to continue to see? One thing many people are questioning right now is what trends are here because we're in the middle of a pandemic soon and what trends such as perhaps clubhouse will maybe be passe when people on a Saturday night can actually go to a restaurant and talk to other people. So we'll see what happens um, in that regard. So moving on to our core topic um, of TikTok and, 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 and their impact in social media. Um, and really, I'm really excited to hear from Sophia in terms of some of the things she's seeing on this TikTok platform that are supporting these trends and others. We're going to cover four central themes, um, the impact of social media on culture, trends, behaviors, and brands. So we're going to jump right into it and first start about culture. Um, it should come as no surprise that two-thirds of consumers believe uh, in sharing their values on social media. And since they are sharing their own values on social media, again, they find it incumbent on brands to do the same. Um, authenticity is a word we hear so much. I think now more than ever, it's really become um, center stage. Um, we ask consumers what role does social media play um, in culture? Um, and they basically said, it helps me feel connected. It helps me communicate. It helps uh, you know me um, stay in touch with what's happening and the information and trends that matter. So again, social media really has become sort of that central line of communications that is dictating culture. Um, nearly 80% of, of people are turning to social media to find out what's happening in culture. So if you want to know the hottest trends, if you want to know who the hottest new artists are, what the kids are talking about, so to speak, you're going to social media. And Frankly, I think the place that people are going to now more than ever is TikTok. I think from where I sit, I think when I think of TikTok, I think of because the algorithm is so good when you when you when you log into TikTok, automatically you're starting to see what the emerging trends are, what people are are, are caring about. And I think that's what one of many things that's made it so very compelling. So I think brands, you know, need to think like marketers and really act like a creator. Talk to me about that, Sophia, in terms of the role of brands and how maybe it shifted over time to be more of a, a role than being a creator versus a traditional marketer. Yeah. I mean, I think it goes back to what you were saying about authenticity, or we like to call it realness. Um, to your point, brands are very used to hiding kind of behind their brand guidelines, look, tone and feel is really defined. And the community, not only on TikTok, but at large, is really pushing brands to be more real and be more authentic. On our platform, you have to do that or you cannot exist right. because you will get called out. And so it's a scary thing. And that's part of my role is to help brands really understand how to show up in a very real way on the platform. So the way that they do that is they act more like creators and less like marketers. Yeah, and I would imagine it's not easy. I mean, um, as being somebody who's very familiar with sort of the programmatic ad platforms, social media, it's easy to market your brand on something like Twitter um, or or Facebook. Like it's, it's, But when you dive into a platform like TikTok, I ultimately get intimidated by, I don't want to get exposed here. I can't just put up an ad. I, we really need to invest in this. So do you find that creates a little bit more of a barrier for brands to enter just because they're intimidated and they don't know how to play in this new world? Yeah, we, um, we our mission or the, the kind of theme that we push out to brands is don't make ads, make TikToks. Right. And it's exactly that, Matt. It's how can you create content that people want to engage with, not talk at them, not push a product at them, but to really just engage the community, entertain the community, and more importantly, co-create. Yep. And so that's a very easy way. You're right. Brands are very intimidated and somewhat scared to, to kind of dip their toe into TikTok. But if you partner with a creator, that kind of gives you a head start. Right. If you co-create with the community, let them take control of your brand. That also helps brands show up authentically. That, to that totally makes sense. So talk to me about what some brands are doing. What are we looking at here from Chipotle? Yeah, so this is a great example. Chipotle is very much a brand that <clears throat> is a real brand and really really can connect with people in an authentic way. That's just naturally who they are. Um, what I thought was really, really interesting about this is this is corn, but what I want to reference is a rice video that they shot on an iPhone. It is 
their most successful TikTok to date, 8.9 million views on the rice video because it was real. Normally QSR brands, and Matt, you and I know from our advertising days, yeah. would never show their food without it being food styled and everything had to look perfect. And Chipotle really leaned into just like authenticity and realness and people loved it. Yep, I mean, it makes sense. I think, again, it goes to what you were talking about where I think if if maybe Chipotle would have went to a traditional ad agency and had them activate, you wouldn't have gotten something as that authentic. It would have looked way more produced, um, and it probably wouldn't have worked on a platform like this. So I think what you're saying starts to come to life there, uh, for sure. You know, I've talked for a while about this notion that brands are people, people are brands, and um, I think that's true now more than ever. That what people expect from brands are really the same thing that they expect from their friends. We asked um, consumers what they expect from brands and they say they want humil humility. Uh, they want optimism. They want uh, determination. They, they're they looking to brands. And we, we went through a period in 2020 where we constantly heard through our research that we did for say the consumer webinar is that consumers trusted brands more than they did the government. That's what they were saying. And they were looking to brands to help guide them through the pandemic. That was really the first time that we've seen that. And it really sort of shows the responsibility bestowed on brands. So it's interesting, you know, hopefully as we exit this crazy phase, um, you know, our brand's going to continue to do that. And how's, how that is that going to impact uh, their content? So um, let's talk about also, Sophia, how brands also enabling stories of others through your brand. You talk about involving the creator. Um, tell me about what, what DSW has been doing. Yeah, this is one of my favorite examples. So DSW basically put out a TikTok into the community. Um, the hashtag was too many shoes. And they asked people to show them their closets, like show us your closets. Matt, 778,000 people showed us their closets. Oh my God. That's insane. This is like the, the level of co-creation from consumers, AKA people with brands has never ever been seen like this. And this is what brands have, and marketers have always wanted yep. to authentically connect with consumers. And I remember paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for ethnographic research to have people show us their kitchens, have people show us their bathrooms and their closets. And, you know, 800,000 people are doing this because they want to, because they felt like this was a fun thing to do. Yeah. I mean, the question becomes in my mind, is this the future of like advertising and advertising agencies? You know, we, we were in a period for so long where if you wanted to create good content, you had to be able to afford an expensive advertising agency like BBDO, right? You, you've worked at all the big agencies and we worked together at MRY for years. We know that world. But now, whether it's a platform like Fiverr where you can actually go to a freelancer network or I think even more authentically doing something like DSW did where you can tap into an audience and all of a sudden you have this plethora of creative input from consumers essentially for free. I mean, that is just so incredibly powerful. And the question is, is that the future? And, you know, so how are brands integrating with their agencies when they work with you guys? Are the agencies front and center? Are you working with them directly? How does that kind of work given yeah. everything I just said? I mean, the reality is that working with TikTok is so new to everyone, to brands, yeah. agencies, to creative people. Um, so, I mean, literally, that is my role. I partner with brands and I partner with agencies to help them understand how to think TikTok first. Um, I don't see agencies going away. Like, agencies come up with the too many shoes, hashtag yeah. too many shoes idea. Yep. What I think is going to happen is that more creative folks are going to think like creators. And right. that's what we're saying, think more like creators. Yep. And, and we're trying to bring more creators and creative people together to help them understand how to do that. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, I think that the agencies great creatives you can never replace because they're coming up with let's partner with TikTok. Here's our brand ethos. Here's how we bring it out. But when it comes to actually the produ production of content, at scale, at least through the two examples we talked about so far, Chipotle and DSW, what we're seeing is authenticity, creator driven. That's what's working on a platform like this, yep. uh, for sure. Um, so let's go to some trends on on social media. Um, liking content on social media can uh, obviously induce a sense of belonging and happiness. Um, what we're finding through many platforms is that people uh, via the content that they like is sort of signaling to other people what they're all about, what they identify with. And then that has, for better or for worse, enabled many social platforms to then get the signals to then 
send them more content. I think the negative of that we've seen is that some consumers end up in an echo chamber where they just kind of signal everything they like. And as a result, they're just getting what they like. And then if what they like might not be great for society, it doesn't matter if all they see. So I think one thing about TikTok that I think people love about it is that you guys have some type of algorithm that really doesn't necessarily do that, that you're constantly dripping in and exposing consumers to new type of topics. Like talk to me about that and, and why it's so special to the consumer experience. Yeah. Um, I think what's interesting about liking historically in social media is um, it, it kind of started to go into a negative place, right? Like you yep. were obsessed with how many likes you had. You were obsessed with showing up in a very, like portraying a very perfect version of yourself. And TikTok has taken that in a different direction because it's not about like showing my perfect self and getting likes. It's about putting content out there that I hope you're going to be enjoy, you're going to be entertained by and enjoy. And that's what likes mean here. So um, that being said, like you could be a creator with 500 followers um, or two likes historically on videos, but the algorithm will push your content out, give it a chance. And if people start to engage with it, it just goes further and further and further out into yeah. the audience. So that is how not only the most popular creators get um, viewed, but newer, like it democratizes creativity and creators. And it also makes it easy to jump in, doesn't it? Because I think, oh, the right. yeah, the UX, uh, the user experience of TikTok makes it that instantly, as soon as you, you log in and for, even for the first time, you have a ton of stuff. You don't need to follow a lot of people first. You just dive right in. I think yeah. that's another great thing about it for sure. Um, so talk to me about, um, this, um, program with the elf and why you think it kind of, kind of pays off some of these themes. Yeah. I think this goes to what we were talking about brands kind of showing up differently on the platform. So elf stands for eyes, lip face, and historically they were really struggling to help people understand that it was an elf like Santa elves, but actually eyes, lips, face, an acronym. Um, and so they were one of the like early adopters on the platform. They were targeting Gen Z. They came up with an eyes, lip, face custom song um, and it just went viral. People were showing off their eyes and their lips and their face. The song was so great. They had celebrities engage with it. They didn't pay celebrities to engage with this. Like this was just all happened organically. Um, they had, so their target was Gen Z. They had women 40 plus moms, grandmas doing the eyes, lips, face, dance and song. It was just something that the community really enjoyed. They had five, Matt, this is crazy. 5 million people make eyes, lips, face videos and participate in this hashtag challenge. And, um, and it, wait, is there like sweepstakes involved? Like what is the motivation oh, for consumers to do this? They just want to join the movement? It's it's our mission is to inspire, inspire creativity and joy. People right. were happy to participate in this. It was a catchy song. They loved showing themselves off. It was a fun thing to do. Right. Uh, and, and I think what's really cool is the song that they created exclusively for this challenge was released on Spotify and iTunes. It hit number four on Spotify's global. Yeah, that's incredible. That, that just shows it's, it's like life imitating our art imitating life sort of thing where it's like the platform now is actually bubbling up to mainstream music tastes, which yep. is, so the question I would have is, you know, you've talked about some, you know, beauty and makeup examples. How does it detergent, brand how does you know a low involvement category a toilet paper brand how you know how do they play is wow. it a place for them to activate as well yeah so um i you may know this but tiktok is full of like millions of micro community communities everything from like witch talk so people who are really into witches um to like cleanliness talk right and so that is like people are into different types of content right so there's a, there's a space for every single brand to play. One example, I know you know the wipe it down challenge. That was a yeah. big kind of theme and trend. Um, that's an easy thing for like Clorox to partner with or, you know, like Mr. Clean. Um, so they're, you know, like it, the ideas are, you know, endless. It sounds like it. Um, and just in terms of um, brands, you know, Obviously, consumers want a game. We talked about information, entertainment, and knowledge. These are the places where brands play. The example you've given us so far is around entertainment. You know, you know, creating this content about your closet 
et cetera. Is there room for a brand to be more informative on TikTok? Does everything have to be something that makes them smile versus something that really informs them and teaches them? Um, so information and education is really huge on the platform. Um, mm -hmm. You everything from people literally teaching languages to um, teaching you how to cook. And we'll talk to Jake later. I know yep. and one of the creators on TikTok. Um, what I would say is, no, it's not all dances and lip syncs and fun and games. You mentioned it earlier. There was a lot of social justice conversation in this country that it played a huge role on this platform. And one trend that I think is really cool, there were um, there was this trend where you would kind of get close to camera and pretend like it was a makeup tutorial and you're like putting your mascara on and you're basically talking about what's happening with the Black Lives Matter movement. It was a way for people to like get people to tune in and actually communicate a really strong message. Right, it was just a way in, a clever way yeah. into the conversations they were having. Yep. Um, and it goes back to um, authenticity. Um, so to, to wrap up, up um, for the last case study before we bring in the other guests, um, Cheerios. Why was this campaign so um, compelling to you and to and to the TikTok audience? I mean, this is a really cool example of how brands, even if you're not officially posting things on the platform, how you need to be listening because even if you're not talking about yourself, someone's talking about you on TikTok. People are talking about brands all the time, and so this creator actually referenced an old holiday ad that she remembers from when she was a kid. And she basically put a call out to Cheerios and said, I would love to see this grandmother and granddaughter today. And Cheerios listened, immediately reached out to those, um, to those actors and brought them back and recreated the ad. Wow. And that happened within a span of like, what, 30 days max. And so this is this is kind of the new marketing too. Brands need to be much more agile. Yes. And I think you would talk about that in terms of insights. They need to like have their ear to the ground. Um, same on TikTok. Yeah, you have to be agile with the insights, but then you have to be agile with your action. And you right. have to align and many companies, big, especially big brands. And this does create an opportunity for, I think, mid-market, smaller companies, um, because I think some of the larger companies with the legal hurdles, et cetera, might find it challenging to be able to, act so quickly. So yeah. I think, you know, that that creates an opportunity. And then before we bring in the other guests, one, I think it, what I'll call, you know, misconception about TikTok is it's just all about Gen Z. Um, and it's just all about young kids. Talk to me about the growth of TikTok with the broader audience, because we've certainly seen that this year. Yeah, I unfortunately can't give the stats on the demographics. Right, but just generally speaking. Yes, but it is not just Gen Z. I mean, if yeah. you if, like what I'd ask everyone is to just download the the app, start it just consuming content and you'll see like there are 85 year old women that are showing us their beauty regimens and their fashion decisions and you know, one thing that happened in the pandemic is we were all together. So Gen Z started sharing TikTok with their moms and their grandparents and it caught. Yep. Makes sense. Totally. So with that, I'd love to bring in um, our other panelists. So um, Toby Daniels and Jake Cohen, would you guys mind um, jumping in and we will go from there. <clears throat> Perfect. Cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, Toby, tell us about yourself. I know everything about you, but. Uh, <laughs> well, what's up, Matt? What's up? Nice to see you, Sophia, Jake. What's going on? Hi, everyone in the audience. Uh, phenomenal conversation so far. You guys have just covered so much ground. It was incredible. Love the chat as well. Ton of really interesting stuff being shared and talked about there. So um, if, you're, if you're not in the chat, check it out for sure. So, yeah. I'm Toby Daniels, uh, founder of Social Media Week, just recently acquired by Adweek and now uh, in a new role as chief innovation officer over there. So I have, you know, 20 plus years in, in digital and latterly in, in, well, I suppose for the last like 12 plus years in, in social. So, um, you know, I've long been a sort of an entrepreneur working and operating sort of, you know, at the intersection of digital and social and marketing. And uh, also, I think during that time, a sort of a student um, of um, really sort of what's happening in regards to the kind of the continual evolution of technology, technology's role and impact in regards to how we connect and communicate. And I think, you know, we are today probably, um, you know, experiencing some of the most interesting 
uh, digital transformations where, where over the course of the last year, I think we've experienced the single most important shift in consumer behavior as we've all had to kind of make significant adjustments in terms of how we connect and how we communicate um, and how we use all the technology tools at our disposal to um, to function and and to operate and to you know keep in touch and communicate with people who are close to us personally and professionally. In other words, um, I think we are you know a, a, a sort of at a point in time where social media, however you want to talk about it or describe it, is more interesting today than it ever has been, and I think it just will continue to become. Um, a really sort of fundamentally important part of our lives, both as a utility and also in terms of how we consume uh, entertainment. So I'm um, very happy to be here and very happy to be talking to you guys. Great to have you. Thank you. And and Jake, tell us about yourself. And first of all, thanks so much for joining. Of course. Very excited to be here. Um, so my name is Jake Cohen. I am a food writer, cookbook author based in New York. And I pretty much came into food media in the old age of print, I worked at Sever Magazine in a very old school test kitchen where the focus was all about print. Digital began to really become important shortly after and I kind of have had the best of both worlds of print and digital, but I think the most exciting thing was, was creating editorial content this entire time as social media really came to be important. I remember when I was the food editor at Tasting Table, the first day that Facebook Live was a thing and we just went live. And then when I was the editorial director of Feed Feed, when IGTV became something that could be in feed and we could monetize it. And I think as social media has continued to evolve and just seeing people's reactions to the way they digest content, that's what I've always been really obsessed with. And it's obviously done well for me because now I can just do it on my own because I can post a ton of TikToks and a few IG reels and, and make a living. So let's talk about that for a second, Jake. You have over half a million followers on TikTok, um, over 300,000 on Instagram. How did you get your start in becoming an influencer? And I don't know if you like to term yourself that way. Cool. Um, and, you know, wh what do you love about it? And then talk to me about ways in which you're starting to interact with brands and, and, and how that sort of shaped your process at creating content. Yeah, I mean, everyone's gonna really like beat that word of authenticity um, in everyone's face and, and, and it's true. I kind of use this as a business card. Social media to me was just an insight to the work I was doing, the recipes I was developing, my unique perspective on food, I think we are done with the days of like the, the Martha Stewart's, the, the people who are just experts in everything. Nobody right. wants that anymore. People want a voice for a specific thing. The, beauty, the beautiful thing about TikTok is you see a million voices that all focus on a specific niche and they have their communities and you know them because they are the go-to for one specific aspect of one specific, I don't know, art, right. let's say food. I know the person I go to for, and even down to like, if I'm going to uh, Chinese food creators, I know the one to go to for Szechuan cuisine. I know the one from Shanghai who's creating that type of cuisine. A and to me, that's what's more interesting in today's world. When it comes to brands, it's a simple of what is the authentic fit? I think that in today's world, we see a lot more power in the creator because anyone who's on TikTok, A, a lot of these brands, a lot of these agencies, they just don't know because right. it's complete. It's, it's just a complete 180 to all the work they used to be doing. I remember when I was first starting to do like sponsored content on Instagram, the decks I get from brands of how things had to look, how everything had to be all just, there was a laundry list. A lot of control, it, right? A lot of control. Right. And now it's at a place where they, if they come to me, the first thing I say is great. This is what I think would work well for my audience to fit into my content. Nothing I post that's sponsored would ever be something that I wouldn't do organically as an editorial piece. And we're seeing more and more of that. And, that, and that's what just does well. I think the best part about today's age is the amount of earned media that you just get from brands on social by either creating good products or telling very unique background stories about how they kind of build it up. That's the, the, the biggest thing right now is like, big brands have to approach TikTok very differently than emerging small businesses who have very different and unique opportunities on the platform to tell the story and build an audience. And what, what do you think your secret sauce, no pun intended, is for how you've been able to build your audience over time? Because a lot of people want to build a half million person audience on TikTok, but only a very few do. Um, you know, what's been your, your secret? 
There is none. I, everyone wants a secret. Everyone thinks like, oh, you have to do this. You have to do that. You have to be yourself. I'll tell you, whether it's Gen Z, anyone who's on TikTok can smell inauthenticity. You, right. can, you just know it. You know when someone's trying to put on a front, they're trying to be perfect. They're trying to be something they're not. And that is off-putting. And then past that, I, I took out all of the stops of everything that I was censored in, in traditional media of the gatekeepers saying what was appropriate, what was not. Guess what? If I want to curse, I'm going to curse. If I want to cook something really fancy one day and do chicken tenders the next, I'm going to do that. And I think people react to seeing themselves in content and creators more so than ever in the same way that you see like celebrities during the pandemic really kind of like, I would say scale back that kind of facade of celebrity and be very active on social media. Um, seeing that it, it's really, it's that human element that kind of will blow someone up overnight. And that's really nice. People also love, they love a, a, a kind of overnight success kind of situation. The perfect example would be Robin Schall, this comedian who had this viral video of her 2020 goals that were just a complete nightmare when she got the end of it blew up overnight, all of a sudden, Kim Kardashian's commenting on her things, Katie Couric's going live with her, uh, every celebrity is reposting it, and it, people love to see that. That's kind of, that. that's an age-old story in every type of thing. That's why you have movies where, and introducing X actor that's never had a role like this before. Um, so, so TikTok and a lot of these social media platforms have just really sped up the process and created an authentic channel to, um, get eyes on people that are already just entertaining. So it sounds like Sophia, what you told me, every brand needs a Jake, right? Every brand needs somebody like Jake who can be authentic, who can be his true self yeah. content. So is there anything that Jake just said that surprises you or anything that it not at all? I think every brand needs like 50 Jakes. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And not only 500, you know, half a million follower Jakes, but like 500 follower Jakes. And, yeah. and Judy's or whatever we want to, um, they need this help map because to our, to the, what we talked about earlier, like it's not a comfortable place for brands to just kind of be real. And I think a lot of brands, I was talking to, um, the head of marketing at HBO recently and, you know, they're like, we have really had to lean in on authenticity. And we did a lot of soul searching internally about what that meant and what, you know, how we would show up that way, because that's what's being demanded of brands today. Yeah, absolutely. So Toby, you've obviously been around for a very long time in the social media game, way before TikTok was a thing. How is, do you think TikTok has changed the game coming onto the scene? How has it changed the landscape of social media? Well, listen, I think TikTok saved social media. And uh, the reason I say that is because 2016... The king of sound bites. The 2016 to 2018 was a rough period of time for social media in general, right? A lot of sort of controversy and scandal, data leaks, privacy issues. And naturally and understandably, a lot of kind of questions were being asked um, in regards to what is social media's role in society is it good yeah. for us or is it bad for us and obviously that conversation continues as in the continued into 2020 but simultaneous to that conversation which i'll come back to in a second um was also then the sort of introduction and just the meteoric rise of TikTok, a social um entertainment platform that functions and operates in a very different way to the facebook's and the Twitters of this world. As Sophia pointed out, this is much more about your interest graph versus your social graph. The yeah. reason why you can go on TikTok and come away from that experience still feeling actually good about yourself is because of the fact that the algorithm is serving you things that it knows that you want to consume. There is a sort of sense of positivity. There is access to kind of creative inspiration. There is truly a, a, a new... Um, a format and form of entertainment that is um, evolving kind of naturally and organically on the platform. And because of that, people are gravitating towards it because we want to be positively enriched. We want to experience joy. We want to have positive entertainment experiences. We don't necessarily want to be dragged into um, negativity and, and, and conversations that are toxic in nature. Um, now, I do want to make the point, however, that while TikTok is, has the potential to save social media and represents something that's truly positive and enriching in our lives, um, let's not ignore the fact that 
we still have some really significant problems that we need to address, right? I talk about social media as something that exists on not just one, but multiple spectrums, right? The best way to think about it is that there's always going to be good and there's always going to be bad, right? You're always going to have high quality content and low quality content. You're always going to have positivity and negativity, right? You have to think about these things on a spectrum. And um, the, the reason why that's important is that we can start to understand how can we sort of address the issues that exist on that sort of one side of the spectrum that kind of represents um, something that's problematic for society, right? Something that is is creating divisiveness and division. And we, we cannot ignore that, but I think we also can take pause and then just enjoy the moment and celebrate um, the just extraordinary level of creativity that is happening uh, on the TikTok and platform, which um, as I mentioned to a few folks in the chat, I spend a pretty significant amount of time enjoying it every single day. It's amazing when you talk about creativity because you know, when I do speaking or when I did speaking, when we had conferences and stuff like yours, Toby, um, you know, I, I was often asked by people, what should we tell our kids given all the changes going on in the world? Where should they focus? And what I always used to say to them is go deep into an art or deep into a science, deep into a science, meaning like learn how to code, build and operate the machines or deep into an art, meaning be creative, do things that the machines can't. And I often found in the past that many people were not gravitating towards those sort of creative aspects of building a career because maybe they didn't see the dollars at the other side or maybe they just didn't trust their own creativity. And I think one thing TikTok has done is it's really put creativity front and center. And I think that's actually a brilliant thing for young minds. I think creativity is ultimately a huge part, especially in America, of what we need to continue to innovate and be a world leader. Um, if there was no creativity, there would be no TikTok, there'd be no Apple, right? There'd be no Tesla. It's at the heart of all of this. So I think, you know, turning on that side of the brain is incredibly important. Um, no. Agree. Totally agree. I think I'd add to that also, you know, I think that sort of the uh, American idols of this world um, demonstrated that like um, talent isn't necessarily the purview of the individual and most successful kind of singers and songwriters in the world. Actually, fairly normal people can have better voices than the most famous people in the world. And what TikTok is showing us, again, that there is a whole nother level of being able to kind of like access um, the best talent in the world in almost every imaginable entertainment genre. And that is going to be explosive. And, and when you sort of start to kind of remove the barriers to entry for people in terms of how one day they can be completely unknown and the next day they can have millions of people having, you know, connected, engaged you know, with them and their talents, we're going to see an explosiveness of new talent. Um, coming into the mainstream world of entertainment. And that's the piece of it that I'm excited about. And also, by the way, that's a wave that brands can really start to think about how they can also ride. Yep. So uh, I love what you're saying, Toby. I just, everybody loves a celebrity, but they love the per the guy next door, the girl next door. 100%. Even more. And um, I, what I find fascinating about the platform is the level of positivity and encouragement and to your point, I mean, not to say that there isn't trolling and negativity, but for the most part in Jake, I mean, like, what do your comments look like on a regular basis? I mean, it depends. A lot of times, very positive. At the end of the day, like you said, there are trolls. There are a lot of issues, I think, in, in general, in terms of the world. And and it lit, there was one video where I just did a, a challah breeding tutorial and it got like thousands of anti-Semitic troll comments. But in general, I also get on a daily basis comments from people who are like, wow, I've never seen this dish that my mom, that my grandmother makes ever represented outside of my home. And for that, that is life changing for people who come from immigrant household who get to see food that typical media has not deemed unimportant um, to now be put in the forefront of a platform like TikTok and, and push to millions of people. That's huge. Is that, a re is that a reason, though, for brands maybe to be hesitant and jumping on because they're worried about the comments, they're worried about the feedback, and how do you deal with that, Sophia? Um, I think uh, brands need to stop trying to be perfect. Like that is the theme right. of this oh, entire true. panel right. and session: is realness and authenticity is the future, and that's what people are gravitating towards. And the more brands lean into that, the better off they are. 
Yeah, absolutely. So we have a few more questions for our panel, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. So anybody in the audience who has questions, and we already have a ton uh, coming in, please just go to the Q&A box um, within the Big Market platform and feel free uh, to ask us questions. Jake, if you could change one thing about TikTok, what would it be? You have a senior executive on the line here. Jake, I'm listening. Uh, I don't think I would change anything. I think at the end of the day, it's it's something that if you change something, people adapt in the same way that, that you would see any new function come into any platform, whether that have, was Facebook or Instagram, or I'm sure it will continue with TikTok. People are just going to adapt and learn. And, and I don't yeah. think that there needs to be that. At the end of the day, my, my, my biggest thing is it's creativity. So there are moments in which I just need to step away because I'm exhausted and I can't think of anything. And that's okay too. I think the issue is, is that brands are typically coming at this idea of like, well, on our Instagram, you have to post twice a day at this time because this is when our audience is on and this, this, this. And at the end of the day, that's just going to drain out the creative process of it. And some of the best content I've done has just been on a whim. And all of a sudden it gets millions of views. And then there's content that I spend hours on cooking and editing and it does fine. You, you, you can't really know, but the most important thing is you just have to be proud of everything and throw it out. People shouldn't be looking to go viral with every video. They should just be looking to put out an authentic platform. And yeah. if they do that, then there will be moments of viral content. But in general, you'll just have an engaged audience that's going to gonna be in, in for the ride of where your brand is going, where your career is going, where your anything is going. They just want to like watch you grow. So that was, that was very well put. Um, you might be getting a job from TikTok before you know it. Uh, <laughs> we're killing it, Jake. Um, so before we open it up to the audience, um, I opened up you know, today's presentation with just some trends, whether it be uh, in the growth of Clubhouse or how brands are you know, integrating with social commerce and, and integrating shopping into the social media experience. We're seeing a lot of things going on with VR, augmented reality. Um, so I'd love to just go around here from all of you um, to whatever extent you want to speak to. What do you think about some of these trends and what can we expect from TikTok and other platforms as we head into 2021? So I will start with you, Toby. I mean, you know, I, I think if we're talking just in general social media trends, yeah. um, you know, I, I, in addition to my obsession with TikTok and the amount of time that I spend thinking about it, both personally and professionally, um, you know, I'm also like, very invested in and 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 looking very closely at, at Clubhouse. I think it's the it's the sort of the new frontier, I suppose, in in social media because it's obviously audio only, audio first. Um, I think what's really important to understand about this particular trend is that it is it represents, I think, the single biggest potential disruption to podcasting because Clubhouse and drop in audio is frictionless. Um, there are no barriers to entry. Um, it's seamless in its kind of like execution. Um, it's live. Um, and it, it further democratizes access to content and to experts and expertise and thought leaders and celebrities. So I think Clubhouse and, and everything that kind of sort of exists within that category will be the sort of breakout um, star and, and potentially the next frontier in social media that we should be looking very closely at. And I think also clearly it represents a massive opportunity for brands because I think brands have struggled to figure out how to play in the podcasting world, but it's way more obvious and way more straightforward for brands to play in the drop-in audio world. Yeah. Cool. Sophia? Uh, I would say the path to purchase or the funnel as we know it has changed. Yep. Um, I think it's a much shorter funnel than marketers want to believe. And e-com and social commerce is um, is it. And so um, brands really need to understand how to shift a lot of their efforts and their funds there. Yep, absolutely. Jake, any any thoughts? Yeah. Standpoint? It's emotion. I think at the end of the day, it, it's kind of changing any content that you would have typically imagined a brand to be making. And then just all of a sudden scrapping that and going behind the scenes. Some of my favorite um, recent purchases have been from people that I find through social media, through the stories of how they built. Some great examples would be um, I think Feel Your Soul, which is this guy who used to work at Trader Joe's, created insoles for Converse and Vans. And 
built up his whole thing on TikTok by showing the process. Another example is this awesome company, again, shoes called Adams that was just featured in Humans of New York. Again, the shoes may be great. I don't know. I'm waiting to get them. But the story of how they built up this company, I, I cried. I cried the whole time. And, and to me, that is, you, you, want your, you want your consumers to be moved. I think the idea of earned media, you see brands like Great Jones coming out of, of people who, who just create a great product and then start to leverage the content that's made by people who use their great product. That's, 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 the, that's the dream. Yeah, absolutely. Some other things I've been thinking of recently is just monetization efforts for creators, you know, whether it's something like fans only or cameo or Substack that enables influencers or creators to kind of have that one, the many connectivity where they can, you know, basically maybe let them come behind the curtain for exclusive content where they can start to monetize their efforts. Because, you know, I, I was recently watching, oh, it was actually a really interesting, I think it was on HBO Max. It was a documentary by Nick Bilton. I think it's called Fake Famous, but he basically takes three people and tries to make them famous. But at the beginning of the documentary, um, he basically says that, it used to be if you ask kids what they wanted to be when they grew up, it was a firefighter or a professional athlete. And now it's an influencer. That's what they want to be. And I, th I do think platforms like TikTok are making this more of a reality because it opens up people's creativity. But at the same time, what are the economics behind it? You know, not everyone is going to be able to get to uh, brands like you've partnered with Jake, like Chobani and, um, you know, understand how to monetize that. So I think some of these new platforms, it seems like you smirked when I talk about some of these platforms. Why is that, Jake? Are you jumping on? Them? I just think it's I know. I just think it's very funny because when yeah. you, and you, you also you said fans only. It's only yeah. fans. But um, the, right. on, the number one way that people on OnlyFans who are um advertising their content is actually through TikTok. Because uh, yeah, there's a lot of parallels between the young kind of influencer generation of, I think that's like the old school influencer of like gorgeous people in bikinis. And now you're starting to see this resurgence of that, but it's not just look at me. It's like, no, 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 no. I'm selling something and you can have more if you click the link in my bio. Right. And, and, and there's something just very interesting of, and I think kind of refreshing about just how candid that is. Yep. Absolutely. So we're going to open up in the audience now. Um, Abel Flint from the Susie marketing team, um, who is a force behind all these. Say, look, here you are. Hey, Abel. Good to see you. Um, hey, so Abel, Abel is going to uh, go into some audience questions. So why don't you dive in? Yeah, I think uh, maybe the first question for you, Sophia. So you have a lot of people here who um, are from brands that have not started to advertise on TikTok or really make content. And I think for them, they, there's a sense that feels like a very difficult thing for them to just break into. So what is your advice uh, for brands who haven't started on TikTok or are looking to build up TikTok presence? Um, like what are some of the first steps that you advise that they really start taking? Um, I would say throw out everything you are trying to do with your old social media strategy on TikTok because it's not the same. And to even, you know, get a head start by just starting to post organic content and, you know, we've worked with brands who have tried just to, like to be witty and they're not typically a witty brand according to their brand guidelines. So just like experiment, try, put stuff out there organically and then partner with us and my team to figure out how you can grow that into a bigger presence and how we can build a strategy. Definitely. Um, Jake, maybe a question for you. So you obviously have worked with a, a bunch of different uh, brands here. For, for people who are working at brands, what is the best way that they can really connect with influencers? Um, and what are, again, some, some guidance that you would give for that just initial kind of outreach? Yeah, um, I think it would be divided into two things. First would be you have this new wave of influencers that have built up platforms on TikTok. A lot of them are going to be just super excited to work with kind of like not old school brands, but more established brands. Like I would say like Le Creuset, which is right behind me. Like they're new on TikTok. They work with this new wave to like send products to people, people that are clearly cooking. They're clearly starting to do this and would never say no to a $300 Dutch oven. And th that's a really great way to just start to organically incorporate their products into other people's content. Um, the other side of that would be brands that are looking to activate with influencers. And in that case, I would say the first thing is Unless you have a product like Le Creuset that people want and are excited about and will go crazy for, 
don't try to screw people over. I think that happens often that brands who think that they can just like give you free product in exchange for content when they really should be paying. And I think you're going to know that based on the fact of, of who this creator is and how much overlap it is in terms of, of the content they're doing versus what you're offering them. There are really organic partnerships and then there are some, some what is it, the square peg and a, and a round hole partnerships where you could just tell it just wasn't a good fit. So yeah. to me, I would say, don't try to look for the just largest following of an influencer. Who is the person that matches your brand? Whether that be what they're creating, who they're speaking to, the way they're delivering their content, because then what you'll see is a lot of people, a lot of brands end up just hiring the, the TikTok influencers. We saw this with a cook named Matt who works at a spice company called Spiceology. There's this other guy, Sad Poppy, just got hired by Headley and Bennett, the apron company to start creating content for them. And, and that's the new thing. That's what we, when I worked at Fifi, I hired Aton to, to help us with our TikTok. And that, that, that's totally gonna be the future. And if you are, as a brand, want to do that, that's great. Just be careful because in, in today's world, people are not afraid to go public. If you try to mistreat them, if you try to undersell them, if you try to screw them over with, with some free stuff in exchange for way too much content, everyone comes around to what's happening very quickly. And I would say just make sure you're aware of, of what the standard rates are for specific influencers um, in that field. Definitely. Um, Sophia, a question for you. So uh, this is from a brand marketer who's asking, if I had to explain to my exec leadership that we should be on TikTok, what should I tell them? And wh what are some of the reasons? Um, I mean, outside of everything that we've covered in today's discussion, I would say um, this is every single brand, and I've been partnering with brands for the last 20 years, every single brand has always wanted to be a part of culture authentically and to connect with people in a real way. And there is no other platform out there to do it than TikTok. That's what I would say. Definitely. Um, and maybe a, a follow-up question there uh, for you, Sophia. Um, it's it's very common that people have this idea that they want something to go viral, right? Like they're like, we're gonna put this content out and that becomes their mo main thing that they're trying to kind of build out. What do you recommend that brands focus on instead versus just like, we need to create something that just goes viral? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I tell brands is download the app because you'd be surprised how many marketers are just know about TikTok from their kids or, um, so download the app, consume the content, and you'll start to get inspired. You'll start to see what it's about. You'll start to get ideas even. Like I look at TikToks and I'm like, oh, that could be an ad for a pizza company. Oh, that could be an ad for, like Matt said, for like um, a shampoo brand. Um, consume the content. And I think the ideas will start to flow. Um, again, like you can be a part of TikTok the way I just gave the Chipotle example, just film your food. Um, you know, Walmart has really leaned into empowering their employees to, to post on TikTok. So there are a lot of ways that you can engage, throw away everything you know about social media and virality and just show up authentically, create authentically. And then you partner with us when you're ready to really kind of amplify those messages, um, you know, participate in TikTok around kind of a larger tentpole event, but get on there, consume the content and just start to create little by little. I'd love to add to that. Um, I think all of those are just like such good points. Um, what's important to understand here though, um, is this isn't just about TikTok, right? It's important because TikTok is a driver of what's happening in terms of how culture is shifting its behavior, right? It's a, it's a sort of, it's causing, um, it's causal, but it's also reflective of, right? So what you have to understand and, and think about when you're on TikTok and you are in that kind of sort of mode of trying to understand how creativity has been unlocked and um, what the, the kind of user behavior looks like and how that compares perhaps to other platforms is that there are new things emerging on TikTok that are going to be ultimately important in terms of how they shape culture off of the TikTok platform and in other environments that will naturally just start to kind of emerge and evolve um, because of how significantly important they are, right? Duets is a good, good example of that. Maybe like an oversimplification, but duets is really important to understand on, on TikTok in terms of how that's 
been ex has a, has had an explosive um, effect on creativity and on um, expression, right? Um, what I would sort of center on, particularly if I was a brand, is understanding not what can I do as a brand on TikTok, but who can I collaborate with to um, and, and, and what behaviors should we be embracing as part of those collaborations that ultimately are going to serve the community as opposed to serving the brand? Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, Jake, an another question for you. So you obviously t went from zero to hundreds of thousands of followers on TikTok. Um, people just want to know, how did you do it? What were some of the pitfalls <laughs> that you faced? Like, what, 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 what exactly went into that process to get you to hundreds of thousands of followers? Boy? I mean, to say, put it very simply, and it's funny because I, I remember the conversation I had with my husband and I was literally said, I want to be TikTok famous. I was, <laughs> I had just built up the TikTok presence for the feed feed, which I was, who I was working for. And they were, they want, they said the same thing to me. They're like, we want to be on TikTok. So I got them a million followers. And as soon as they hit a million, I was like, you know what? This is crazy. I want a million followers too. Um, and it just, it comes down to like, I started creating content. The first content, I mean, it just, it, nothing happened. And then eventually, I remember my first viral video was actually with, with Susie President Avi's daughter who had just gotten on TikTok. And I w had already had some success with the whipped cream challenge, which was another like TikTok trend. And I was like, great. So this was a story I told. This is my niece. She just got TikTok for the first time. We're gonna make her TikTok famous today by doing teaching her the whipped cream challenge. Boom, posted 1.2 million views nice influx of followers. From there, you just continue going, you see what works, what doesn't, and build on it. I think the key part is as soon as you see something work, it's not about like doing something completely different. It's like, well, what's the adjacent piece of content you could start creating that does it? I am a creative, so I get bored very quickly. I was doing avocado slicing videos that was like just very like visual ASMR-y, and then I got bored of it, so I moved on. Then it was the collaborating videos, and I did every type of collaborate, and those did really well and got me a lot of followers. And then it was pasta, fresh pasta. And I just find something, see what relates to people, do it like a season of a, of a television show, and then I move on. And everyone's gonna re relate differently with social media. I think the most important thing is finding formats that work for you. I know the formats that work for me, that work for my audience. If you if you don't know that, then you, then that's I would say that's the first thing to do. It's like what? How are you telling your stories? You remember the most the most ridiculous things do really well. I want to piggyback quickly on something Jake said. So like that um, video that he made that actually ended up being really popular. That was not a challenge he created. That was something he Correct. piggybacked on, right? And the same for brands. This is a question I get a lot for brands. Like, can we participate in challenges or in trends? Or do we have to always create our own? No, be a part of the community. Participate in what's happening already. People really embrace that. But I mean, yeah, look, the perfect example is like the feta pasta challenge right now. Every feta brand right now in the world <laughs> should be doing something around this. They're probably not, but... At the end of the day, like this is, this is, you just have to follow. It was the same thing. I, I think there was one, it wasn't even a sponsored hashtag on TikTok about people's favorite Amazon purchase, about the one thing they bought on Amazon that they can't live without. Like they're one random internet purchase. And people love that because that's just the way they live. That's the way they talk to their friends. That's the way they share content. I'm really passionate about this one gadget I have in my kitchen. That's, that's, it's so simple. It's so simple. And I think that's what's so scary about it. It's stupidly simple. It's human nature. <laughs> that's great. Um, so I guess maybe my, my next question for you all is uh, for brands that are working with creative advertising agencies that are filled with creatives with very strong points of view on what things should look like, how they should be presented, all of that. And, you know, I, I remember working, you know, at an agency and that was a big issue we faced is not giving creators the authenticity, like, how do you guys balance that with like a creative agency and then like influencers who have their own creative spirits in them? And maybe that could be Jake or Matt or Sophia. Or yeah, Toby. yeah, yeah. Um, to be fair, like it's the bane of my existence. I hate, I hate working with agencies um, because of just that. I'll send them the content that I know will work well and they'll have some edit, but they won't, they won't understand the caption. They won't understand this edit or things like that. And, and I just have to explain everything of, of why, which I mean, it's just annoying. It, it is what it is at the end of the day, I'm not gonna yield to them, um, but it's a simple, uh, it's a simple fact of, of you can't 
You can't trust anyone but yourself. If, you, if this is your brand, you get to decide. You can take advice from agencies. Agencies have had great success in terms of a relationship with um, influencers, creating really successful partnerships. But at the end of the day, I know my favorite brands that I follow on TikTok or the favorite stories that actually influence me to hit buy are not high produced agency content or, or relationships. It, it's organic. Uh, I'll, I'll add something, um, not in defense of agencies, but more sort of highlighting why the system is not going to con continue to work or even be supportive to the ways in which brands should be participating within these different kind of platforms. And that's because agencies complain about working with creators and influencers all of the time as well. Why is that? Because they've been the arbiters of like creativity and ideas for such a long time. They're frustrated, right? Because they think- We're also they very difficult. Contribute. And in some cases they might, right? They, they you know, manage and own the relationship with the brand. They might not you know, claim to understand what the brand is, brand is trying to achieve. The problem is not the agency or the creator. The problem is the system doesn't work. And we have to create a new uh, collaborative system that works for the environments in which we are creating content and engaging um, you know, in, in these new mediums. And maybe Matt, a question for you as someone that ran a very large agency working with many top creatives, like what are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, it was a different world. You know, when I left the agency world, it was 2015 and now we're in 2021 and six years later, you know, I think the decisions for the future of brands are no longer made in the boardroom. They're made on the sidewalks. And I think we started to see the shift happening, um, you know, towards the end of my agency career at MRY, where I was always pushing, you know, about the power of the individual and, and user generated content and all those things. But there was still sort of this force field that brands put around themselves where legal and procurement and risk mitigation made everything they put out for the most part, just, you know, very inauthentic and didn't really connect and they all want to go viral but that means risk it, it's just like anything else it's risk versus return the greater the return the greater the risk right and many big brands don't want to take the risk um i think now brands have no choice i mean and just I, i'm even more emboldened in that statement after being on today's webinar that the only things that are working on the hottest uh, emerging social platform TikTok is things that are done by users. I didn't see anything that was produced. Um, so I think agencies, if you're a good agency, you're understanding that and you're creating templates and, you know, an approach that embraces people like Jake and supports people like Drake, Jake and give him a brief and the assets and the style guide and the things he knows and then let him go to work because he knows his audience. He knows what's best. Nice. And but equally, yeah. e equally, I think that, you know, someone asked the question in the chat, like, well, what does the new system need to look like? And, you know, equally, it's important to ask Jake, what do you need, right? What do you need to be able to scale? And what do you need to be able to continue to just do what you should be doing, which is the, the, on the creative and the content creation side and the community engagement kind of pieces. But you need infrastructure, right? You need processes. You, the, you know, the space needs to continue to mature and to become more professional. So in terms of what the system needs to look like in the future is that like, you know, Jake needs more infrastructure and that he needs more organization around him to enable him to do what he does best so that he can do it in an, in an uninhibited way. Um, maybe, Jake needs to look more, look, feel, and function a little bit more like an agency. Right. That, that is, that is going to be the future. Final, yeah, I'll make one final point. I think creative agencies are going to start to hire more creators and bring them in house, and creative people will start to be creators. I think that is that's where we're moving. Brands are certainly doing it. In fact, Hollister is using TikTok to hire people. Um, so they put out, you know, and ask for resumes via TikTok and the submission, you submit your resume as a TikTok. 100%. So I think, you know, pe brands are bringing creators in house agencies will too. Absolutely. 100%. I mean, I can tell you like every single time I go on LinkedIn and I start creating content, all of a sudden I get great people that want to work for Susie and I get great new business leads for Susie. So it's like, it's, it's B2B as well. It's like the more you're putting stuff out there, adding value to your audience, the more it comes back to you. So I think that you, everybody, it's incumbent on everyone to understand this because it's really the new world that we're in.
I, I want to make a, a point on behalf of TikTok, but sort of speaks to this idea of, um, you know, this is not just the kind of the, the domain of the big B2C brands. You know, tic TikTok, and this is the kind of the little known secret, not particularly well known kind of secret about TikTok is that um, it, it is currently already having, but in the future, it's going to have an extraordinarily important impact on small businesses. Um, because the opportunity um, for small businesses to be able to participate in these environments and to create content and reach audiences is going to be significant. Again, it's yep. that the barriers to entry have been lowered, but the spaces and the opportunities to be creative and to engage people creatively um, is going to increase. And so we should be thinking about small businesses in the same ways that we think about um, creators and influencers on the platform. Toby, we're actually hosting a session in March in our virtual platform specifically dedicated to teaching small businesses how to be successful on TikTok. So um, for anyone who wants that invite, feel free to reach out to me. Awesome. Definitely. Great. And uh, we're basically out of time, but there's one final quote here that I just want to share with you all. Um, but this person, Alexandra, said, wow, listening to you all uh, really inspires me and motivates me to create better and real content for my brand. So I think you have all done an incredible job to inspire some of the leading brands across the world. Um, but thank you all so much for, for joining this incredible conversation. Yeah. So thank you, Abel, for all the work you did behind the scenes to put this together. Um, Toby, always great seeing you. I'm sure you'll be back um, and, uh, you know, on many other webinars and congrats on your recent deal. Uh, with that week, I know you're going to go on and do great things there. So great seeing you, Jake. You're going to have many new followers after today. So <laughs> I can't wait to check out your stuff. Sophia, always great to be reconnected. And I'm so happy for all your success um, at TikTok. And we'll have to do something like this again. So uh, on behalf of myself and the Susie team and Toby and Jake and Sophia, I want to thank everyone for joining the latest edition of State of the Consumer. And we'll see you next time. Stay safe, everyone. Take care. Bye.